Can you see <clears throat> polycystic kidney disease? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Okay, PKD. This should be um, a continuation of the concept in module one with acute kidney injury and CKD. But in this case, this will be causes of <clears throat> uh, chronic kidney disease now. So if you recall, one of the causes of CKD was PKD. So this is a genetic condition. <clears throat> it's passed on from um, parent to child. It has a high um, mortality. Um, or at least leading to uh, chronic kidney disease. So what happens is you inherit the condition and there are two forms here. We have childhood and adult. Uh, childhood has um, a lower incidence. Okay, it's, it's less common. Most common form is the adult. Now it doesn't mean that, that they acquired it. They still had it at birth. However, they do not develop the disease until they hit around past 30 that's when they, uh, they develop the condition. So what happens is, based on the name, it's polycystic kidney disease. So the kidney develops multiple cysts. I hope we have a picture right here. Uh, this is only a drawing. Uh, it'll look worse in an actual kidney with, with the cyst. So imagine blisters, fluid-filled blisters or cysts <clears throat> growing all over your kidney. See here, you have no kidney parenchyma left, although they don't all develop at once. But once they start developing, the kidneys will look like this now. So these cysts are not kidney, um, are not functional kidney tissue. So once they overwhelm the kidney, the kidneys as good as gone. So the, um, the nephrons here, are now replaced with these with these cysts that do not function like normal kidney tissue. So as a result, the patient, of course, will have a lower glomerular filtration rate, and they just the the main uh, treatment here is <clears throat> going to be supportive. We just try to maintain the kidney function for as long as possible until we can get a, a kidney transplant. So this is really the same story as what happened to ESKD, um, which we started off in um, module one. And then the patient will end up in dialysis and of course, uh, hopefully get a transplant. And that's basically it. Until then, we just support the patient, you know, treat the resulting ESKD uh, that develops after the cysts overrun the kidney and the kidney is no longer functioning, so you manage uh, blood pressure, you manage electrolytes, you, uh, what else did we do in uh, ESKD in a dialysis patient? Besides blood pressure, um, electrolyte, and protein restriction. Level. What was that? Creatinine level, sodium restriction. Yeah, so all those, um, again, this is not new. We already discussed these in a patient with chronic kidney disease or with uh, end-stage kidney disease. The same story. The cause is just different. So unlike <clears throat> um, acute kidney injury, wherein it was pre, intra, and post-renal, right? So this one is uh, obviously intra-renal, but the cause here is not uh, acute kidney injury. This is now chronic kidney disease because the disease developed slowly over several years. So the onset again for the adult type is past 30 years old. I know somebody who had this, well not directly, it's actually my one of my best friends. His wife has PKD. So she had no idea, so they got married early in their early 20s and then their children are grown now. She discovered she has PKD, so she started having symptoms of chronic kidney disease over the years, and then uh, the doctor monitored it, 
<clears throat> and then diagnosed her when they did the ultrasound. They, they found she has polycystic kidney disease affecting both kidneys. <clears throat> and so she went on dialysis. She pleaded with her siblings and relatives, you know, who can be tested for her, to, for, for them to give her a kidney. She never got a response. So she's on dialysis still today. And unfortunately, because of all these hap that happened, they eventually divorced. Um, I don't really go into that, but um, so that's what happened. So this is a sad um, genetic condition. It doesn't have to end with a, you know, a sad ending. It can be a happy ending by doing the the patient does her his or her part by um, attending genetic counseling um, and not having biologic children. I mean, there's a a chance you can still have biologic children because it's not 100% that they'll get them. So if it's okay with your ethics, you know, your personal ethics that you do, um, <clears throat> you know how they uh, fertilize embryo and then pick out which embryo um, doesn't have the, the disease and then they'll choose to implant that one. Have you heard of that? Because they can do that now. Uh, yeah, and that, that depends so they on have the, identify the gene that will be caused by the Yeah, so they'll, uh, they'll, what they'll do is, this is one way to still have biologic children and not pass it on is to choose. You no, know, you, you, move, you um, fertilize several eggs and then you choose which uh, embryo has no, you know, no sign of the gene and then that's what they'll implant. Uh, but that's again, uh, that's playing God. So it depends on the um, the the ethics, the um, morals of the uh, the patient. But that's an op that's the only option, I guess. The other one is, of course, not to have biologic kids. You just adopt. <clears throat> so how do we know you develop it? So again, we're only talking about the adult type, not talking about the peds. Maybe you'll discuss that type in uh, pediatrics. So early on, again, this is CKD. So the onset is really insidious. It's, it's several months, several years in the development. So one of the first symptoms would be hematuria, and then there's low back or flank pain. Then you start having uh, UTIs and uh, urinary stones. And we make a diagnosis, of course, based on a CAT scan or uh, ultrasound. You can also do that here, a CAT scan. This, then you can, like I said, it's conservative because there's really no uh, cure for it. You, your kidneys will eventually, until then, just maintain. Um, body function. You know, you don't have kidneys, so you go on dialysis. And while on dialysis, we do the sodium, potassium, protein restriction, fluid restriction, um, and just maintain dialysis. That's it. There's nothing new. Uh, manage blood pressure here. So we have ACE inhibitors um, or ARBs. And complications are the same of those with CKD. So a patient with CKD, of course, has anemia, right? You remember anemia? Uh, patients with CKD develop an Yeah, yeah we remember anemia. Anemic? Go ahead, Israel. Oh, what was the question? Uh, why do CKD patients develop anemia? Oh, I thought you were saying, do we remember what anemia is? Um, but why do... Uh... Yeah, there was anemia, right, in CKD? Yeah. Would it be because of low iron? Mm, no, what hormones do the... What hormones does the kidney 
produce? Um, I think it's the erythropoietin. Okay, very good, Richard. So it's erythropoietin. So the kidneys go, they won't, there's nothing that will release erythropoietin, so a patient will also develop anemia. And that's it. So these are your symptoms again. Management is the same as in CKD. Uh, monitor weight for fluid status, do fluid restriction, um, restriction for protein because that will affect BU and creatinine levels. The more protein you eat, uh, sodium potassium restriction. So pretty much taking care of a patient with end stage kidney disease. Any question? No questions? All right, let's, let's go to uh, infections now. First is pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis, unlike, this is now the kidney infection. <clears throat> a UTI can go up the ureters and then infect the kidney. But um, if you, once you have a kidney infection though, it's no longer called a urinary tract infection. It's now called pyelonephritis. So this is infection of the kidney. It may start as a urinary tract infection, like I said, or it may not. It may start from the bloodstream. So you get a a blood infection and then it ends up in the kidneys. But most common cause is a urinary, lower urinary tract infection. Here are some of the causes. So all of them are infections. So we have just various ways by which they end up in the kidneys. So here, for instance, is reflux. Uh, we have obstruction causing not only stones, but also, I mean, not caused only not by stones, but it, it could be strictures, or it could be also be the uh, prostate. Okay, so prostate stopping the urine or a blood, uh, you know, a stone causing a obstruction. And then there's now uh, urinary retention, and then you have a UTI having a Foley. <clears throat> uh, pregnancy, uh, UTIs are common in pregnancy, right? Uh, who among you here had UTIs while pregnant? And then finally, sexual activity in women. <clears throat> so this is um, not washing, no, no hygiene uh, before and after sexual activity. Uh, this is not being biased against women, but because of uh, the anatomical structure. So by anatomy, there's really not much difference between the three orifices. So the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra are so close together. So uh, it's common uh, for bacteria to migrate between orifices. Most common causative organism is E. coli. So we have different ways by which the infection reached the kidneys, but basically now this is our problem. The infection reached the kidney. So by prevention, that would tell us, of course, you, you prevent the causes. Uh, most common causes are a UTI. So therefore, you know these are the causes right here. <clears throat> so um, wash before and after uh, sexual activity uh, for pregnancy, do the same. Um, and then uh, have your, you know, have, get your prostate fixed or uh, do for those who need a Foley catheter, so do Foley catheter care, uh, etc. Manifestations, as already described earlier, so you have the flank pain. Costal vertebral is the flank pain. Okay. So another term for uh, flank is costal vertebral tenderness. And because most of these come from a UTI, so you'll have signs and symptoms of a UTI also. So the infection swam up here and reached your kidney parenchyma. Diagnosis, 
uh, although a UTI is easy, you get a urine sample, you get um, urine analysis and urine culture. Uh, however, to diagnose pyelonephritis, you have a, you need a blood culture now because now the how it reaches the kidneys is of course either via the lower urinary tract or by the bloodstream. You can also do as usual the urine, uh, renal ultrasound or CAT scan, for instance, will give you visualization of the inflamed kidney reflecting the infect the infection. So here's our urinalysis. Um, blood culture, and of course we, we get a urine culture also. Here, urine analysis and urine culture. Uh, WBCs in either case will be, of course, either specimen, I mean, will be elevated along with the signs and symptoms of the pyelonephritis, the clinical ones, the pain and tenderness. There may also be blood present in the, <clears throat> uh, in the urine. So here we have not only bacteria, but also hematuria. This is an infection. So uh, what do you think is the treatment? Hello? You're breaking Antibiotic. All right. So by myself here. Yeah. Patients have been given, of course, this is an as far as IV, please read the details here. So it may not always be IV antibiotics unless the patient is already septic uh, or what we call urosepsis. But mild to moderate illness can be given oral antibiotics as stated here. So we maintain adequate hydration to keep urine flowing. That way we don't exacerbate or promote another infection because of urinary retention. Any questions so far? The, as far as the specific antibiotics used, they are not different from those commonly used to treat UTIs. So you should be familiar with Bactrim. That's trimethoprin with sulfamethoxazole. Uh, that's very effective for common UTIs. Uh, those hospitals again for this time for urosepsis already on top of the pyelonephritis we given the antibiotics. Other routine antibiotics for urinary tract are Cipro. Uh, please read details here uh, for the examination. Okay. So. Any questions so far? Uh, guys, any questions? No. All right. No. Let's go to non-pharmacologic interventions now. So we help promote healing by avoiding any nephrotoxic agents. Doctors will also do their part by choosing which antibiotics are the least nephrotoxic to avoid further damaging the, the kidneys. Uh, fluids are always great. So at least eight glasses of fluids every day. We already know the benefits of using cranberry juice. So cranberry is um, what we call an acid ash diet. So it will promote an acidic urine thereby retarding bacterial growth. So we try to uh, give uh, as much fluids as possible. 
Now for the pain, because the patient will complain of bladder spasms, uh, we will be expecting to administer urinary analgesics such as phenazopyridine or desperidium. Now take note that uh, pyridium is not an antibiotic, okay? It is only for the bladder pain. Is that clear? And we do not use pyridium for a long time. It, this will only be for a few days. I think uh, pyridium is used for three days um, at a time. That way, um, one reason for that is we don't want to mask the um, symptoms of, uh, of the infection also. So that's why we don't encourage long-term use of pyridium at least three days at a time um, is the usual protocol. Complications, of course, this may start as an infection, but if you remember in module one, this was also one of the causes of both AKI as well as CKD, especially if the infection is not treated as stated here, recurrent or poorly treated pyelonephritis can lead to permanent damage to the kidney, resulting in CKD and eventually ESKD. Uh, this one, please read this on your own. You should be familiar with this already. Uh, it's not, it's nothing new. It's just that most symptoms of a uh, UTI in the elderly may not be the same as most adults. The only symptoms they will present could be only delirium or con acute confusion. Depending on the cause of the pyelonephritis, so let's say it was from um, an enlarged prostate, for instance, then it may be necessary for surgery to be done on the prostate. Or if it's a stone, for instance, the stone is causing the urinary retention leading to the UTI and eventually pyelonephritis, then it will be surgical removal of the calculi. Uh, management of stones will be discussed in another part of the, of the textbook. Uh, we'll discuss that later. Any question on pyelonephritis? Right, to summarize, pyelonephritis is in infection and inflammation of the kidney itself. Causes can be directly from the blood or it can be from a post-renal cause such as obstruction caused by a stone or, or the prostate or a ur lower urinary tract infection which swam up the ureters and then reached the kidneys. So besides the uh, treatment of, of antibiotics, we also have um, routine management of any patient with AKI or CKD, which is to <clears throat> avoid nephrotoxins, uh, encourage fluid, and uh, it's not bad if you use cranberry, okay, that will help. And then for the symptoms of bladder pain, symptomatic treatment will be pyridium or phenazopyridine. Any questions? So you'll also include this one. This box will be uh, opened later. I think it's, the, it's toward the end of the... Oh, right here, sorry. Box 62-1. So here is a repeat again. This was learned already in Fundamentals of Nursing. So please read on your own. Mostly involves hygiene, the importance of fluids, um, perennial care, especially for uh, women, and then avoid these because these will change the uh, pH of the perineum, promoting bacterial growth. 
and they should be educated on the signs of UTI and here's the cranberry juice. Any question on pyelonephritis? Jordana? Or Nicole? All right, questions. Let's go to, uh, we won't cover acute glomerulonephritis. The next topic is page 14. What page is this? 1402. All right, let's continue with UTIs and we will end with stones and the complications of kidney stones. So we just completed the box for UTI prevention and for especially for the females in this class, you are familiar with UTIs or you should be familiar with UTIs because uh, this is more common in females because again of your anatomy. So these are the causes. So this would be a good select all that apply question. In the hospital, our most common cause is related to the catheter. So here are your evidence-based guidelines for people who have who, who need a urinary catheter. So while they have it, this would be <coughs> um, your guidelines. Take note that antibiotic for prophylaxis is not used. For people who, especially people who have long-term I mean, um, urinary catheters, though I'm, I'm referring to those that are in long-term care facilities, nursing homes, for instance, or other um, facilities, uh, even assisted livings, for instance. Some people will need a catheter forever. One example are those who have a neurogenic bladder, meaning the bladder does not contract it cannot empty so they will require long-term catheter use an option would be some doctors will put in a suprapubic instead because it's it has a lesser chance of uh, uti if you create a suprapubic rather than having the catheter in the perineum they will put it over the hypogastric area But uh, in either Professor, case, do you mind going up a little? Going up? Uh, the front where? Might be a uh, I was just referring to the causes. Okay. Okay. okay right here. So causes of common causes of UTI. Um, where was I? Okay. So for prophylactic antibiotics, urologists. Who are the specialists concerned here along with the nephrologist uh, they do not recommend treating UTIs in patients with um, a long-term catheter they I, I, I worked with one and he said because because when I reported it to him hey there's a UTI in the in the urine in the urinalysis now don't take this as for test material okay this is just a uh, personal experience so the doc it's in related to prophylactic antibiotics um, the reason why he said he told me he didn't treat the UTI is because the patient will have a UTI regardless because the patient has had the catheter or has needed a catheter for over 10 years now. So the patient will have 
UTIs almost every month. So he said he, he stopped treating it because what he discovered was since these people will have UTIs anyway, as long as they remain asymptomatic, meaning there are no clinical symptoms of a UTI, the patient is not complaining of pain, there's no fever, uh, nothing like that. He said he'll only treat them if they absolutely become symptomatic. The reason is it will only grow um, multi-drug resistant organisms if he keeps treating it. Did, did you understand? Yeah. Okay, so same thing here also, the same concept. So prophylactic antibiotics should not be routinely used because, again, our concern here is we're only going to create a superbug if we constantly uh, use antibiotics for these patients. Okay, so uh, when you come across urologists like that, so don't be uh, alarmed that some of them will choose not to treat a UTI, even if there's evidence of a UTI, okay, only in patients with chronic use of a catheter, meaning they'll avoid, they just, you know, for the patient's best interest, they decide they not they will not treat a, just a patient as a positive uh, urinalysis, all right? They'll, they'll wait until the patient actually has symptoms before they treat them, but that's not the general rule. All right, so here is the pathophysiology. Our urinary tract, especially the orifice, is dirty. We have bacteria there normally growing, but the bladder is sterile. So that's why a urine um, taken by a, a straight cath, of course, is sterile because once urine leaves via the urethra, that urine, of course, is already contaminated unless you clean the orifice before the patient void it. Uh, you should be familiar already with the UTI. Common clinical features are the following. You may not have all of them. Some patient may just have the painful urinary urination or the frequency or urgency that may be the only symptoms uh, but for uh, some patients they may have uh, blood in the urine and may have the lower abdominal pain along with the uh, painful urination and frequency these are your com most common causative organisms e coli number one again because this is a permanent resident of our GI tract. We have E. coli in the stool, uh, again in the female, so this is the most common causative organism. See they have, they account for 80% of all uncomplicated UTIs. So that's why the treatment are the same. So most commonly for those of you who've had a UTI, have you noticed they prescribe the same antibiotics as you've had in the past? Doctors usually use the same thing because uh, the assumption is it's caused by E. coli. As already mentioned previously under the pyelonephritis, so we have Bactrim again, Cipro. These are the most common antibiotics. We also have uh, Macrobid or what's the generic name for Macrobid? Miss, anyone here practicing as a nurse? No, no. Uh, Macrobid, oh, okay, uh, it's a nitrofurantoin. Nitro yeah, thank you. So nitrofurantoin <laughs> is, is macrobid. That's also quite commonly used. So here, an uncomplicated UTI, non-pregnant women, non-diabetic, non-febrile. Uh, it can be treated with three-day course. Doesn't have to be seven to 10 days. Okay, as, as long as, again, uncomplicated, meaning these are the usual, uh, especially if they found early, meaning no, um, no sign of uh, uh, fever, meaning it's not 
uh, it's it's local okay no uh, no systemic involvement uh, non pregnant non diabetic so it can be three day course of antibiotics only complicated gtr on the other hand must be at least 7 days 7 to 10 days in both cases we use the analgesic again because of the symptoms see this is for the super pubic pain and also for the painful urination so this is a bladder analgesic complications of ATI of course we just concluded pyelonephritis or in worst cases you may develop an abscess in one or both kidneys Surgery, again, as mentioned earlier, for the cause of the UTI, usually if it's um, the prostate again, or in some cases, may patients may have like the seal, for instance, then the surgery, of course, will be, is it will be, have you, uh, fish, Anyone heard of a fistula? Yes. Uh, yeah, so the same. Well, with regards to the AV fistula, which we discussed in dialysis, so what is a fistula? Why do we call the, um, the one used for hemodialysis in atrioventricular fistula? Kind of like uh, no, sorry. Tunnel, right? atrial, it's atriovenous. Sorry, sorry. It's atriovenous fistula. Why is it called a fistula? So, what is a fistula? Is it um, because it it stays in there permanent than the other one? I can't hear. Can you speak louder, Janessa? I said because it stays in the vein permanent than the other one, I guess, I don't know. Okay, but why is it called a fistula though? So what is the yeah. definition of a fistula? It's like an opening in a part of the body, I don't know, to transport. Okay, it's an, uh, yeah, that's correct. It's an abnormal opening or an abnormal connection. Okay, it, the, the key here is an, it's abnormal. Um, is your colon normally uh, connected to your small intestine? Yes. Yes, right? Yeah, it's a continuation. <laughs> Is your uh, vagina connected to your uterus? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, it better be. Okay. Now, a fistula is an abnormal connection between two normally non-connected organs. So an example is, do you have a normal connection between an artery and a vein? Is an artery normally connected to a vein? No. No. The heart? Well, before an artery meets a vein, they have to meet at the capillary, right? So the answer is no. An artery and a vein are normally not connected. They only meet at the capillary level, meaning they have to go smaller first before they get a glimpse of each other. But they're normally not connected. So when you created a connection, when, you, when the surgeon created the fistula, he connected an artery and a vein. So this is now an abnormal connection between an artery and a vein. That's why it's called a fistula. So here, the fistula here, how does a fistula form and cause a UTI? So some people, due to a cancerous cause usually, may have a connection between the bladder and the vagina, or it could be a connection between the vagina and the colon, because they're all uh, structures very close to each other. So in the sense of causing a UTI, it could be that the bladder has an abnormal connection or there's a fistula formed between the bladder and the rectum or the colon, okay, causing some, some feces to enter the bladder and into out, of course, that will contaminate the urine. Now the bladder is no longer sterile 
then they'll have frequent UTIs. Okay, I met someone like that. I forgot her name. Well, I can't say her name anyway. So the poor patient has had nonstop UTIs over the years. And then uh, finally, she found a doctor who believed her because all, according to her, all the doctors were just blowing her off, you know, and just saying that, oh, you just really have really bad, you know, you have poor feminine hygiene. That's why you get these, these infections. Okay, because they see they see E. coli in her urinalysis every time, and then uh, you know she said there must be something wrong because I clean you know I clean myself down there very well, and then I still get these UTIs almost every month you know every week sometimes twice a month, right after she treats it. She treats one, she develops another one. So she she's fed up with it. And then finally a doctor, she went to a cancer doctor and then found the fistula. She had a, uh, uh, actually there were double because it was oozing. I mean, you can literally see feces oozing out from her vagina. I wasn't even really sure if it was the vagina or the urethra. I mean, the stool, you know, like, um, liquidy stool was oozing out and you can see it coming out it wasn't from the rectum okay so she wasn't because she wasn't incontinent so she had no control over this feces that's coming out you know after uh, she got the diagnosis anyway so that's another potential cause of frequent utis so to summarize these are again your common cause uh, symptoms of a uti and as far as interventions, we already Perfect. talked about them in pyelonephritis. Uh, so it's antibiotics, the pyridium for pain, and uh, increasing fluids, as well as cranberry. Professor, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, that story that you just told, how like, did they think that it was a personal hygiene if they saw the feces coming out of your urethra? No, no, no. At that time, it wasn't uh, clear yet. So they, when she submits a uh, urinalysis, they see E. coli. So they just think, you know, they assume. At that point, she wasn't seeing feces yet. Oh. So when we saw her in the hospital, yeah, when she was already admitted in the hospital, so that's how she presented now. So it was pretty bad on the front, obviously, because now actual feces instead of just the, the bacteria are now present in her urine. It's now actual feces. Okay. So there's a hole oh, from, I, vagina, from, the, um, from the bottom to the vagina, from the anal to the vagina? Uh, well, you can't <laughs> her um, vaginal you know, rectum. There was a, a fistula there that formed. Uh, I found the, uh, remember I said earlier, peridium is only used for three days? Yeah. So here it is. All right. Uh, here's your teaching. It wouldn't take, so same thing as before. So we're, we keep uh, repeating these. These are almost redundant. Um, here, I always say this, right? Wipe from back to front. And complete all antibiotics. Yes, yeah, from, from, from back to front, right? Yeah, back. No, to front. it's from right. front to back. No, it's back to front. What? Well, because you're a man. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> it says right, right front, back. Yeah, I'm so yeah, happy that's what I said. Back fun. You keep saying the wrong thing. It says front to back. That's what I said. Back to front. Professor, stop it. All right, let's, let's finish this up. Let's Stay go from. to stones now. Uh, there are different types of stones. We have calcium stones. We have uric acid stones. Um, different types depending on the, uh, the cause. Now, they could also be found in different locations. So you can have kidney stones, you can have stones in the ureter, which is uric, 
ureteral stones, and we can have urethral stones, we can also have bladder stones. Um, that's just in the renal system. So we have stones also in the gallbladder, but that's another story. So we have nephrolithiasis. So those are kidney stones. You have ureterolithiasis. That's in the ureter. And of course, you have um, urethral uh, lithiasis as well, or um, urethral stones. Please read the cause, uh, the other risk factors here. Let's say, for instance, um, here it's from dehydration, uh, usually, especially in the uh, elderly population. All right, so there could be, besides the stones I mentioned earlier, the types, so we can have cysteine, uric acid, as well as xanthine stones. I already mentioned calcium, which is the most common. Number one manifestation is pain. Uh, for those of you who've ever had stones, uh, luckily I've never had one, but I know a few friends who've had them, and they just ball up into a fetal position with the pain. I uh, can't imagine how much pain they must be feeling, but um, I mean, these are grown men that uh, I see, but you know, they're in such pain when, when the stones <coughs> uh, pass or when they're having the stones. Uh, other symptoms besides the pain is of course, uh, especially if they pass it, is gross hematuria, or it could also be microscopic bleeding. Either way, there's blood in the urine. The pain will be consistent with the location of the stone. So if it's in the kidney, the pain, of course, will be in the costal vertebral or the um, retroperitoneum, retroperitoneal area, or what we call flank, flank area. see it, you have to press with the KB of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder. If too, too small, then they wouldn't show up. Then you need a treatment. Treatment is hydration. So you give no hydration in the hopes that if the stones and uh, can be big, the doctors won't even attempt to have you pass it. They'll have to break the stones up first in order to that they'll be tiny pieces, five millimeters or less than five meters before you can uh, have a pass. So you can pass it. There has to be, um, there has to be other um, interventions in order to break them apart first before we can pass them or they'll just surgically remove it so because that will be um, medications to relax the prostate as well as the urethra are the following this will help dilate the smooth muscles allowing or facilitating passing of the flow max. You've probably seen these in patients with enlarged prostate. They're taking tamsulosin, right? Or another is, what's the generic name for Abodart? Anyway, Abodart is not very well used. It's, it's flow max that's uh, frequently used. Uh, others are doxazosin, terazosin. You've probably seen these in hypertension patients as well. So they work the same way. They are vaso, um, dilators. So they work on the lower ureter, uh, as already mentioned, to help pass the stone. Surgery. So if the passing of the stone is unsuccessful or the stones are really big, greater than 10 millimeters, then the patient will have to do either um, 
cystoscopy. Um, cystoscopy only goes up to the bladder, but if the scope goes all the way to the ureter, then we call it ureteroscopy. Utero, uh, we can also have this percutaneous lipolithotomy is the is done in radiology. They'll use a catheter. They'll insert a catheter in your flank area straight into the kidney and remove the kidney. We can also have green uh, greenfield um, lithotropsy, or we call um, shockwave lithotropsy. So this is literally giving shock waves through your flank area to break up the stones. There will be some, a little bit of minor bruising over the flank area as a con uh, uh, side effect of this procedure, but they're very, um, they're non-invasive, uh, very effective in breaking up the stones. That way you can pass them naturally. But the most common procedure is uh, cystoscopy. So the complete name you'll encounter them once you start working is cystoscopy, left or right, um, IJ, um, anyway, it, it's cysto. So here is they described here the shockwave treatment. So a patient will have um, what we call MAC anesthesia. MAC is uh, conscious sedation. Uh, MAC stands for monitored anesthesia care. Uh, it's beneficial because you only, you know, you, they just give you a cocktail of medications. You're in la la land. You have no recollection and you're a Wait, they have a short half-life. Within 20 minutes, the drug is out, you're awake again, and the procedure is done. So this is endoscopy. So cysto, if it only goes to the ureteroscopy, if it goes up to the ureters. Let's go now to complication. Now, if a stone, we will have a main cup of urine here. Remember, urine is sterile in an infection. In the bladder, or also remember stays in likelihood there will be now so here is pyelonephritis and when that end of stream now we're dealing with urosepsis now even more uh, serious because this become starts at the urine at the kidneys but then it could go systemic one is this is, remember in module one, this is one form of post-renal kidney uh, injury, which can develop into CKD eventually, if not treated. If the patient develops what's called hydronephrosis, uh, why is hydro? Uh, we have no picture. Okay, hydronephrosis is if the urine that has already uh, been in the bladder goes back up to the kidneys <clears throat> and flood, then floods the kidneys. We call that condition hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis can lead to AKI and then eventually CKD because the damage is now permanent. The patient will uh, have that permanent um, damage on the kidney. Patient eventually develops CKD. Uh, before it gets to the kidneys, of course, you will have two other conditions. <clears throat> so let's review. If you have, let's say, bladder here, your bladder is now full of urine. It's now distended. Let's say it's over three liters already in there. Eventually, the urine will go back up here. 
causing what's called a hydroureter. If you, this one, for instance, you compare the right versus the left ureter, the left ureter here is considerably bigger. So this is what we call a hydroureter. And then once it reaches the kidney, urine now floods the kidney, although the kidneys came from the urine. I mean, the, the urine came from the kidneys. It's not supposed to go back there. So look at the comparison now. So this is now called the hydroureter. And this is what we call hydronephrosis. Both are post-renal causes of acute kidney injury and may cause permanent damage leading to chronic kidney disease. And that's it. Here's a script to read this on your own. Oh, um, to confirm that the patient did pass the urine, you will have to strain the urine. Um, there are disposable strainers uh, in clinical. <clears throat> so they're more plastic. All you do is uh, you, you ask the patient to pee into the, um, the urinal or in the, the hat for females. And then before you dump the urine, you strain it. You, you, you run it, um, you pour it through the strainer to see if there are pieces of stone that was passed. Because the doctor needs to know for documentation. And that's it. Any questions? This is page 14. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's the end of module 9.